Hello and welcome to Business 360. I'm Ashmit Kumar and here are the headlines that we're tracking this evening. Markets end the day and the week flat after bouts of heavy volatility. But Indian equities are turning into foreign money magnets once again. $7 billion come in during July and August. Data points to a lot more inflows on the anvil as India's fundamentals stand out against other Asian and emerging markets. The rupee weakens sharply against the greenback as the dollar index climbs to a 20-year high. Traders watch for U.S. jobs data due later in the day. Demand for work under government's flagship Manrega scheme is lower than the last two years, reflecting a return to normalcy after COVID-led distress. Data shows that monthly demand for Manrega work has fallen consistently. There has been a 56% dip between May and August. The government proposes some strict testing standards for electric vehicles and EV batteries to improve safety. Proposals include multiple sensors to detect temperature and electrical fluctuations and a safety fuse. Seek stakeholder feedback in the next 30 days. Starbucks names Lakshman Narsimhan as the new CEO a day after he steps down at Reckitt. CEO Lakshman will join Starbucks on the first day of October and will be succeeding Howard Skulls from the next April. 13 bidders enter the race for a minority stake sale in NTPC Green Energy. Sources say bidders include Canadian Pension Fund, Petronas, Brookfield and ArcelorMittal and add that NTPC is hoping for 2,000 crore rupees through the sale before it looks at listing the subsidiary. Prime Minister Narendra Modi commissions India's first indigenous aircraft carrier, INS Vikrant. The 43,000-ton warship, which costs 20,000 crores, is the largest to be built in India and puts India on par with five other countries that can build their own aircraft carrier. Well, let's first get to the day's market action. Now, it was a flat end to a volatile week for the markets. Uh, Sensex and Nifty closed flat after swinging between gains and losses. Nifty slipped three points, while Sensex gained 37. Mid-cap index gained for 11th consecutive week despite falling by over 100 points. Anuj Singhal is joining us now with a quick market wrap. Uh, extremely volatile session today, Anuj. Well, the day was quite volatile, as has been the case with the ent uh, entire week. Even though it was a truncated week, the markets made some big moves this week. 200, 300 points a day sometimes, but is actually ending the week absolutely flat. Uh, so, you know, the jury is still out on which way the market's headed. Uh, just for the day, though, it was clear that uh, the banks were trying to get their mojo back. Uh, the bank nifty sort of outperforming once again, uh, while the nifty was uh, a bit soft. Uh, uh, HDFC Bank, Kotak, Axis, SBI, these were the kind of names uh, which did well in trade today. But, uh, on the downside, of course, you had... Uh, uh, you know, some of these auto names where there was some profit taking, uh, like Hero Motor Corp, uh, Maruti as well. Uh, Reliance has been a bit, a bit of a problem for the market. Infosys as well, uh, that also was a bit soft. So these are a few stocks which sort of dragged the markets. In the FNO space, uh, there were some big gainers like Astral, India Mart, and of course Adani Enterprises. Uh, all in all, as I said, the jury is still out on uh, whether the bulls or the bears have a control on this market. Uh, as of now, both are trying their best. Well, meanwhile, crude oil prices are climbing again after suffering steep losses. The surge in prices comes on the hope that OPEC Plus producers will discuss uh, output cut at a meeting scheduled on the 5th of September. Both Brent and NYMEX are trading with gains of more than 2% after slumping by almost $9 per barrel in the previous two sessions. RBI Governor Shakti Kanta Das said that he's studying why the GDP growth for April to June quarter at 13.5% was lower than the RBI's own estimate of 16.2%. Speaking to Z Business, the governor said that while domestic economic activity is resilient, it is the global factors that are hurting India's growth and fueling inflation. Speaking on the weakening currency, the governor said that the rupee is stable and better placed than the other currencies thanks to India's strong forex reserves. He also assured that the central bank will try to minimize impact on growth when tackling inflation. 
From Delhi now, fewer people are demanding work under the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee Act, or Manrega, as per the Finance Ministry. Now, this reflects a return to normalcy after two years of COVID-led distress. There has been a 56% decline in the number of people seeking jobs under the government's flagship rural employment guarantee scheme uh, between month of May and August. Sapna Das, in fact, joins us now with more details. Sapna. Absolutely. In fact, the, the finance ministry data is also pretty much clear on that front and the Manbreka data is in public domain. Uh, this can be easily availed and checked out. So starting off first, of course, uh, the ministry's comment saying that uh, in the last two odd years, there has been a significant decline in the demand for work uh, under Manbreka by the by individuals especially. So if you look at FI22 versus FI21, FI21 was the year when COVID was at its, uh, at its peak and there was a COVID-led uh, COVID uh, nationwide lockdown. So if you look at FI22, around 40 odd crore people had availed or rather there was demand for work by individuals under Mandrega, 40 odd crore individuals. Uh, the number was much higher in FI21 at close to 45 crore. So that's one data set. Uh, also month on month sequentially this uh, this decline in the demand for work uh, is very much visible. So if you look at uh, the finance ministry data point, they are talking about May on May, May this year compared to May last year. So this year May, uh, you know, the number was almost half of what it was last year. Uh, the demand for work by individual category is down by almost 41 percent and if you come down to august now august in fact uh, the demand has been the lowest so far uh, you know, around, and if you compare this with May, uh, it's a sizable dip of almost 56 odd percent. So in May, maybe around 4.4 crore individuals uh, demanded work under Mandrega. In the month of August, this is below 2 crores. So this is what the data uh, indicates. But ministry at its end is clear that they are not trying to say that uh, this could be because the job market is stabilizing. But the ministry is very much clear on the fact that this clearly indicates that there's a return to normalcy after two years uh, of distress caused by COVID. Right, Sapna, thanks a lot for that. So slow, slow shift there back to normal after the pandemic. Let's shift focus now. Auto companies are confident of registering uh, strong sales uh, growth heading into the festive season. Uh, Vinod Agarwal of Aisha Motor told CNBC TV18 that while commercial vehicle sales in August were impacted uh, by the monsoons, the company has a packed auto book for buses, including electric, uh, electric buses. Meanwhile, Shashank Srivastava of Marty Suzuki said pending bookings uh, crossed 4 lakhs in the month of August, and the company's exports also continue to show a strong trajectory. Uh, the number of working days for production in August were uh, less. There were 23 days against the normal uh, 25 or uh, 26. So I think that explains uh, that uh, small drop. We had uh, pending bookings, in fact, cross 400,000 at one point of time during the month, now stands at 377. In fact, we ended up being number one exporter for passenger vehicles with 238,000 units. And we expect the exports to be in the same range, slightly higher than last year. The month of August, uh, there is also impact of monsoons. Uh, so I think it's that. Otherwise, uh, CV industry per se is doing very well. And uh, we are expecting good growth overall for the year. Uh, if you look at first five months, uh, we have sold 28 and a half thousand. And uh, which is 91% growth over previous years, first five months. And uh, if you look at the industry, industry has grown by 88%. So uh, we are doing better than the industry. From the auto to the aviation space, SpiceJet is likely to receive around 225 crore rupees under the Emergency Credit Line Guarantee Scheme or the ECLGS. Sources have told CNBC TV18 that the money will be used to clear any pending statutory dues and payments to lessors. Meanwhile, coffee giant Starbucks has named Lakshman Narsimhan as Howard Schultz's successor. The 55-year-old executive will be joining Starbucks from the 1st of October as incoming CEO and will fully take over from Skulls in April of next year. Skulls uh, will remain on the board after the transition. Lakshman's appointment to the Starbucks uh, top post comes a day after he resigned from Reckitt. Mangla Malu gets us more on Lakshman Narsimhan's new innings at Starbucks. Lakshman Narsimhan is a sought-after man. When he announced his uh, exit from, unexpected exit from record, the stock fell about 5% and everyone was wondering what's brewing. Well, tell you what's brewing. He is the new Starbucks CEO. He will succeed the interim CEO and founder Howard Schultz from April 1, 2023. He joins Starbucks on October 1, 2022 as incoming CEO. 
So he takes over as CEO only from April 1st, 2023. Prior to uh, you know uh, joining Starbucks as CEO, he of course was the CEO of Reckitt Ben Kaiser, where he was appointed on September 1, 2019 itself. So in three years, his key achievement was to navigate Reckitt through the pandemic itself. He's also held various leadership roles at PepsiCo. In fact, on a side note, uh, when he was the CEO of PepsiCo Latin America, he actually went ahead and struck a deal with Starbucks itself. So now it's a bit of a full circle. Let's talk about this star's bucks now. His base salary will be $1.3 million, then cash incentive of 200% over this base salary. And joining bonus, he gets about $1.6 million as well. The important things he has to watch out for in Starbucks Global, the challenges and multiple opportunities. The first one is bringing business back post-COVID. Of course, a lot of the to-go sales have met uh, pre-COVID levels, but you know, overall business has been uh, under pressure post-COVID, especially on account of inflation and rising costs. Other couple of factors that he'll be working on, worker unionization effort that has been taking place at uh, their Buffalo, New York, uh, you know, area. So that is something he'll have to navigate through. And on account of that, there was higher employee turnover as well. Navigating competition is something that he'll have to manage to keep Starbucks relevant. And growing presence in other geographies, will India be included in that or not, is something we will have to watch out for. While he was, uh, you know, a part of this list earlier itself, he keeps his place in this illustrious, ever-growing and elite list of global business leaders of Indian origin, joining the likes of Sundar Pichai, Sandeep Kataria, Arvind Krishna and Shantanu Narayan. Now, a quick check of uh, the court corner. The Supreme Court agrees to hear a public interest litigation seeking measures and guidelines for population control has issued a notice to the centre. The PIL cited overpopulation as a violation of fundamental rights. India is the world's second most populous country. The court, however, rejected a public interest litigation which sought to make Sanskrit a national language, slamming the petitioner for seeking publicity. The court said that the parliament is the right forum for addressing the issue. The Supreme Court also refused to hear uh, and entertain a PIL seeking probe into the killings of Kashmiri pundits and Sikhs in Kashmir Valley between 1989 and 2003. The court suggested that the petitioner withdraw uh, its application and raise its grievances before the central government. Here's some news now from the auto space. On the back of several EV fires reported across the country uh, in the last few months, the government has proposed additional safety requirements for batteries that are used in electric vehicles. The new norms are proposed to be effective from the 1st of October. Parikshit Lutra gets us more details. Parikshit. Well, yes, uh, there was an expert panel comprising of officials of DRDO as well. This was way back in March when there were seven to eight EV fires that were reported. Now, that panel came out with conclusions about why these fires took place in each of the scooters and also recommended changes to our testing criteria. Basis that report, uh, the government has uh, changed the tri uh, testing criteria or added additional requirements for electric vehicles for their certification. And this includes additional safety requirements for testing battery uh, designs, for testing the battery management system, the cell, also the short circuit mechanism in, um, in, these, uh, in these batteries. So all of this will come into effect from the 1st of October. This is what the government is proposing. These, these are draft notifications at this stage. Conformity of production norms uh, where even after certification, companies have to submit their components of vehicles for testing to the ARAI. That will now apply to the electric vehicle segment as well. Uh, let's see how the industry responds. There are some clarifications which have been sought, some meetings have been sought because some companies feel it will be difficult to comply with this by the 1st of October. Right, Parikshit. So there's the government response introducing new compliances for the EV industry uh, to work with. Uh, let's move forward now. Power generating company NTPC has received bids from 13 companies to acquire a minority stake in the company's green energy division. Sources tell CNBC TV18 that the company is looking to raise up to 2,000 crore rupees from the stake sale. Abhimanyu Sharma joins us now with more details. Uh, Abhimanyu, take us through the NTPC monetization roadmap, uh, but first tell us uh, about the interested bidders. 
But Arsenal Mittal, Brookfield, Canadian Pension Fund, NIF uh, are among the bidders uh, uh, as far as the 13 bids are concerned for NTPC's green energy stake sale. It remains to be seen how these bids will be considered and uh, what will be the amount of stake which will be divested as, uh, as NTPC green energy remains open to raising up to rupees 2,000 crores as equity and it remains open to stake sale between 5% to 26%. Also, uh, NTPC is looking forward uh, for listing of various of its subsidiaries, be it NIPCO or NVVN. Uh, also, NTPC is looking at uh, the possibility of uh, selling off its non-core assets, particularly in the fertilizer domain. Uh, NTPC, uh, what sources have indicated that NTPC is not going to launch any greenfield uh, coal thermal power plant. However, it's also not going to close down any thermal power plant uh, more than two, uh, two th 200 megawatt capacity. Uh, it remains to be seen what is going to be the status of the bids for NTPC Green Energy since uh, the, the subsidiary of NTPC is looking forward to raise money as part of this exercise. Right, Abhimanyu. Uh, with that, it's time now to slip into a very short break. But coming up on the other side, Prime Minister Narendra Modi commissions India's first indigenous aircraft carrier, INS Vikrant. Details when we come back. Welcome back. Now, in a big boost to India's defense arsenal, Prime Minister Narendra Modi has commissioned India's first ever indigenous aircraft carrier, INS Vikrant, at a special ceremony in Kochi. Called uh, at, as in fact India's largest warship, INS Vikrant is built at a cost of 20,000 crore rupees. The Prime Minister called the warship a vibrant symbol of Indian pride. <laughs> It's victorious, it's valiant, it's Vikrant. India has got its second aircraft carrier and Vikrant has edged its place in history once again. The original Vikrant had played a stellar role in the India-Pakistan War of 1971. It had helped liberate Bangladesh and that is the legacy that the new Vikrant has to live up to. But at birth itself, the new INS Vikrant has created history because it's a symbol of Aat Nirbhar Bharat. The ship behind me has been created from scratch at the Kochi shipyard from where we are reporting at the moment. Right from the steel to the fittings to the hull to the electrics to the mechanics, everything is uh, Swadesi in nature. And that is what the Prime Minister emphasized when uh, he dedicated INS Vikrant to the country when it was commissioned. What the Prime Minister said is that the need of the hour is not just to showcase India's might as far as his military prowess is concerned, but also ensure that balance of power. At a time when China is flexing its muscles in the Indian Ocean region, we've seen the war of words over uh, Sri Lanka's port where the Chinese ship was dogged. We've also seen the ongoing tension at the line of actual control in Ladakh. And in that backdrop, for India to ensure that China gets the message of Vikrant was required. That's what the Prime Minister's message too was, but that's not the only reason why Vikrant has created history. It has compartments for women sailors as well. Women in defence forces have always been a sticky issue. So in that sense also, Vikrant is creating history. It has been commissioned, but will get operational only next year when all the air assets are tested and uh, tried. But already you can see behind me fully loaded MiG-29Ks and uh, helicopters are there to give you a sense of what this mighty aircraft carrier would mean 
when it sails like a queen with its fleet fully armed into the sea. Right, so a proud moment there for the Indian Navy. But moving forward, the emergency credit line guarantee scheme was one of the most significant announcements uh, that we saw during the peak of the COVID lockdown. Now, almost two and a half years since then, and with regular changes in the scheme, Sapna Das looks at its performance in this report card and tries to figure out if some of the subsets of the scheme have, in fact, outlived their existence. Sapna, over to you. There have been four versions of the ECLGS so far and altogether the government has guaranteed loans worth 5 lakh crores. But as of August, the scheme still has a headroom of over 1 lakh crores in unused guarantees. There is also a wide gap of approximately 86,000 crores between sanctions and disbursements, which indicates that actual demand for such kind of guaranteed loans is not uniform. And industry has not availed the facility in all the categories as was probably expected. For instance, ECLGS 2.0 was announced in November 2020 specifically for the 26 sectors under stress due to COVID. These sectors were chosen as per the recommendations of the KV Kamath panel. It also included aviation, hotels, restaurants and tourism, the sectors most hit by the pandemic. But so far, including all the extensions, total amount of guaranteed loans availed under ECLGs 2.0 is less than 21% of the guarantees given by the government in total, with sectors like real estate and textiles being the major beneficiaries. ECLGS 3.0 has even fewer takers, specifically designed for sectors like civil aviation, hospitality, travel and tourism, and sports and leisure. This was first announced in March 2021, almost one year after the nationwide lockdown, but before the disastrous Delta wave. However, offtake under ECLGS 3.0 has been almost negligible, at less than 4%. The finance minister has increased the allocation for this scheme by around 50,000 crores in the budget. However, total offtake stands at less than 12,000 crores. Why has the offtake been poor under this window? Well, the COVID waves have become less life-threatening, especially with the vaccination drive gaining momentum. So businesses and cash flow for these sectors has been picking up, even if the recovery has been a little sluggish. But restaurants and hotels have asked the government to simplify the application process and tweak the eligibility criteria to make it less restrictive. We now come to the mother scheme that was announced in May 2020 and subsequently enhanced by over 1 lakh crores in June last year as a response to the Delta wave. A whopping 76% of the government guaranteed loans under the overall ECLGS have been registered under this window, with government guarantees touching almost 2.70 lakh crores. Interestingly, most of the beneficiaries under this scheme are from the trader community and entities that belong to textile, service sector and food processing. One of the key reasons for the success of ECLGS 1.0 was that it was announced at the height of the nationwide COVID lockdown and it specifically targets micro and small enterprises. Now, with 1.5 lakh crore worth of guarantees still available, there has been some speculation as to another extension of this, of this scheme. But this may not be on the cards. The government is generally of the opinion that despite the economic recovery being slow and uneven, there is still a recovery. And so, keeping the scheme alive beyond the financial year end may not be warranted. A final call, of course, will be taken by the finance minister in her next budget. Right, Sapna, thanks a lot for that. But with that, it's a wrap on this edition of Business 360. Thanks so much for watching. News and updates will continue right here on CNBC TV 18.